this video gives us a chance to take an in-depth look at a good car and one which has received an enthusiastic welcome from a good deal of the motoring press. It is, of course, the new Vauxhall Astra lineup, destined, I think, to be a reasonably tough competitor for Escort and Orion. But, you know, when you start to look at this car closely, you get the feeling that there could be less to it than meets the eye. It could simply be an example of the expertise of Vauxhall's marketing department. But if there is less to it than meets the eye, let's start here. What does meet the eye? The new Astra is available in 7 Series. There's a Merit, no L Series car, an LS, a GLS, CD, SI, SRI and GSI. It sounds a lot, but even so, there are only 26 Astra models compared with 49 Escort and Orions. So let's take a look at the engine lineup and see how Astra faces up against Escort. Leading in, Astra offers a 1.4 injected engine offering 60 PS, the exact equivalent of the 1.3 litre Ford engine, also with 60 PS. Moving up, there's an 82 PS 1.4 injected Astra engine, which compares with the slightly less powerful 1.4 engine, which offers 73 PS. Astra does not offer a 1.6 engine at all, and remember on Escort LXs you can have a 1.6 for the same price as a 1.4. There is no 1.6 injected offering from Astra either, as there is from Ford, although there are rumours that one will be with us next spring. Then there's a 2-litre injected Astra engine before moving on to the hot engines at the top of the range. Both Vauxhall and Ford, of course, offer diesels. The Astra is a 1.7 at 57 PS, the Ford a 1.8 at 60. From the styling point of view, it certainly looks sleeker than the outgoing model. It is, as some have said, now merely Euro bland. You keep thinking it reminds you of something else, particularly from the rear, but you can't quite remember what it is. That old Astra hunchback has gone, and they've finally done something to slim down that C-pillar, which made manoeuvring the old one a bit like trying to reverse a van. In absolute dimensions, it's a little bigger all round than the old Astra. At 159 and a half inches, it's longer than Escort. It's 66.5 inches wide, again wider than Escort. And at 55 and a half inches high, it's over two inches taller than Escort. Okay, so does its size pay off then? Well, the answer really is no. If we start with headroom, in the front, Astra 38 inches, and Escort 38 inches. Moving to the rear, Astra 36 inches, and Escort 37 inches, which is very odd when you remember that the Astra is over two inches taller overall. Let's have a look at legroom then. Front legroom, maximum for Astra 39 inches, maximum for Escort 41 and a half inches. In rear legroom, Astra is better. The minimum rear legroom on Astra is 26 inches. Escort can only offer 24, but you do pay a penalty for that extra rear legroom, and you pay it here. Luggage capacity, Astra 12.7 cubic feet, and Escort 13.4. That, of course, is with the back seats up. And what about the fuel tank? Astra 11.4 gallons, Escort 12.1. So overall, it's not that wonderfully impressive, is it? It impresses rather more when you get inside. It does look very well finished, it, it's neat. And full marks to Vauxhall for that instrument panel layout, I think that's very legible and clear. They've done something rather interesting with the radio. They've split it into two, putting the display up here and the instrument itself uh, below it down there, obviously for security reasons. And finally, Vauxhall have discovered RDS some six months after Escort and Orion and congratulations to them for that. And I just hope that their security system works as well as Ford's key coding, which, as you know from that recent magazine article, is effectively unbreakable. The steering wheel is nice. I like it very much. What a pity it doesn't adjust. That's just the sort of thing that more and more customers are asking for these days, along with features like remote tailgate release, not available on the Astra, or options like the quick, clear, heated front screen, again, not available on Vauxhall cars. But if they're asking for that kind of thing, how many people are really asking for a pollen filter. Now, this is something that Vauxhall have made enormous play about, as if in some curious way they'd reinvented the wheel or something. If you've ever seen one, a pollen or clean air filter looks like this. This is half of one, actually. Not a very impressive piece of kit, and this is not a Vauxhall pollen filter. This is a Ford clean air filter. It's been available on all Ford car lines for the last four years or so. It's going to be available on current Escort and Iran from early next spring, from the beginning of the pollen season. And if you choose to have one, and if you need one, you can buy it very easily. It costs 19 pounds, 45 pence, including VAT. And frankly, for my money, it's simply not worth making a song and dance about. The other thing that Vauxhall have made a lot of noise about is recyclability. 
Has it escaped their attention that something like 85% of most cars on the road is recyclable right now? I think it's a bit rich of Vauxhall to try and make capital out of an industry norm. Vauxhall have also made a lot of noise about seat belt tensioners. But as far as the tensioner is concerned, remember this, if ever it's activated, it has to be reset back at the dealership. Staying on the subject of safety, and brakes, it is perfectly true that high series Astras have ABS as standard. But if you wish to opt for ABS on any of the other cars, it will set you back, wait for it, a whopping 915 pounds to opt for the privilege compared to Escort and Orion's price of just £495. On the subject of security, it's true that Astras have deadlocking, which I think is a good feature, and high series cars have an anti-theft alarm. The others will just have to hope they don't get nicked, because an anti-theft alarm on the lower series cars is an extra cost option. So, the more you look at it, the clearer the impression is that Vauxhall really are making a lot of noise about not very much. And, talking of noise, it's when you get behind the wheel out on the road that you begin to realise that there might well be less to this car than meets the eye. You see, apart from the new body shell, this is not an all-new car at all, not by any means. The floor pan and the mechanicals are carryover from the previous model, as indeed are the engines, apart from the odd tweak here and there. Now, on the engine front, the petrol engines are catalyzed. That's to say they're catalyzed whether you like it or not. You can't get a non-catalyzed version. And I think that's going to raise an eyebrow here and there with one or two fleet operators. Now, while it's perfectly true that some fleets will only take catalyzed engines, which of course they have a choice to do from the Ford range, it's also true that other fleet operators take the view that there may be service cost implications at the moment with catalyzed units, simply because so few drivers appear to understand the problems of the catalyzed engine. Problems that can be caused, for instance, by putting the wrong fuel in or by bump starting. And that, I believe, will produce a service cost implication in the minds of some fleet operators. The engines are no sparkling performers either. This 1.4 unit, for instance, takes 21.9 leisurely seconds to go from 50 to 70 in top gear. Now that's slower than the Escort, and that's in an area in which the Escort is supposed to be <laughs> a weak performer. And I think the reason for it is this. You see, all these side impact protection bars and the other bits and pieces they put on this new car have materially affected the weight. The new Astra is something like 80 kilograms on average, heavier than the outgoing model. Now, 80 kilograms is about the weight of me. So from the driver's point of view, he already has a passenger in the car before he gets in. As for the suspension, well, it's fine until you want it to do anything. Let auto car and motor take up the story. At higher speeds, the pliancy is replaced, at worst sending shudders through the body shell. And there's an underlying suggestion of float that seems to undermine ultimate suspension control and makes the Astra less than completely secure. And finally, a nice touch on the 82 PS LS 1.4 Astras and above. There's a feature called a one-shot power driver's window. Now, if you haven't come across this before, what happens is that you just press the power window switch once for about a second and the window will then carry on coming down all on its own. The only difference is with this car, it also goes up all on its own. Watch what happens. Imagine that this crisp, fresh, juicy apple is the finger of your very young child. Draw your own conclusions. So in summary then, what we have here is a very clever reskin. So how are Vauxhall going to sell it then? Well, at first sight, their answer looks very convincing indeed to a customer. It is to give him more car for the same money. Sounds great, doesn't it? But they haven't done it by holding the price down. They've done it by cutting the dealer's margin to 10% and introducing a variety of rather complex schemes whereby the Vauxhall dealer may earn himself an extra 3% if he tries really hard. You see, the wholesale price has gone up a lot. Now, understandably, Vauxhall haven't exactly advertised the effect of this strategy. And it is not just the retail customer, but the fleet buyer too, we believe, who will eventually have to pick up the tab for it. You see, the customer will end up paying more for his Astra because the dealer doesn't have as much margin with which to negotiate. 
Now the trade buyer in a year or so's time won't be interested in the Vauxhall dealer's problem, which has now become the customer's problem. He'll place a residual value on that car as if it had been sold on a proper margin like every other car, and he'll discount it, we believe, accordingly. Result, the likelihood is that the buyer, whether fleet or retail, loses at both ends of the deal. Maybe it was that thought that prompted this remark from an article in Fleet News recently. No matter how I do my sums, the on-the-road price for a new Astra is a substantial increase on the older model. There is nothing for nothing in this world, and while the Astra is clearly a good car and is going to be a tough competitor, you must remember this. It is not all new, it doesn't drive particularly brilliantly, and it makes a great deal of noise about very small things, like pollen filters and catalysts. It is, in short, a million miles away from being every car you'll ever need. In contrast, it seems to me, the Escort and Orion range offers the customer real choice. For a start, something he doesn't have to choose. No Escort or Orion customer has to choose an anti-theft alarm. They come as standard on all the cars. If he wants an automatic, he can have an automatic Escort or an automatic Orion. There's no automatic Astra. And talking of the Orion, there's no four-door Astra either. There probably will be. It won't be called the Belmont, but there isn't just at the moment. Small things too, small thoughtful things. If you buy an Astra estate car, you do get the roof rails, the side rails, for free. Unfortunately, if you want to put anything on them, you have to have the bars that go across there. And that costs you £170, including a free tonneau cover. As you know, on an Escort gear estate, the whole package comes as standard. If you want a choice of engines, you really do have to look the Escort way, because Astra simply has a very limited choice of engines at the moment. They say there are more engines in the pipeline. So do Ford, and indeed there are. Astra is a tough competitor, that's for sure. And if you want an Astra Cabriolet, by all means buy one, if you're happy with the old model. And that old model will be with us for some time to come. No, I think in summary it comes down to this. This is a proper range of cars, properly organised for the customer, at value for money prices, and with a pricing structure that gives you the flexibility to make that all-important deal.